So you've all seen the program, which is not sure why you're here. We have had lots of discussions in the planning team over the past few weeks and months about the uh, themes that are entering the program. You will have seen that the sessions all follow or are tied to particular themes. And before we go off and start engaging with the sessions, we did set aside some time to have each of the theme leads from the partners come up and just present very briefly a snapshot of what each theme is about. And then we also have um, a friend that we will um, invite to the stage to give a human story, a human face, what these themes are about. And um, I can say more about that in just a minute. So, Silly, would you like to kick us off and say a little bit about what is to be expected in the food and agriculture theme? Thank you, Carolina. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to, to be here at the DNC days, and you can see oh, the picture change. One of the main introductory pictures was about food and a food market. So, food and the agriculture system are really at the heart of our life. They are at the heart of supporting sustainable development goals, but they are also part of the main climate solution. We should think that it's not only about industry, transport, energy in the solution, but it's also in the overall agriculture and food system. And in particular, I would like you to remember a few facts. More than 2.5 billion people have agriculture-based livelihoods. This is not even counting people who process and distribute and sell foods on the street. This is a big figure. And most of these people are living in the South. In addition, they provide 50% of the food supply for the world. Even more, 80% in developing countries. This is extremely important. Farmers, especially small-scale farmers, are on the front line of climate change. They're facing many risks, multiple risks, but those extreme events affecting them are big. Agriculture sectors absorb more than 26% of the total cost of damage and loss. Here I'm changing to damage and loss. We've heard loss and damage. It's, it's mutual compatible terms. It's just used differently by UNTRR and UNFCCC. When it comes to drought, agriculture absorbs 80% of the total damage and loss. This is really enormous. So, we are extremely pleased to have these themes treated today as one of the priority issues with all of you, working with many partners. Um, it's not FAO speaking alone here, I'm speaking on behalf of a larger team. We are working together with no legal egos, no logos, working together, as Karina nicely said, for advocating, for putting especially small-scale farmers at the center of the action. They need to be paid with fair price, not only because they produce food, but also because they sequestrate carbon with the forest and the soil that they manage properly. They take care of the nature with ecosystem services, and they should be rewarded for that. But this is not happening. Hunger and food security is rising today. And I think Ruth can speak more about this. I don't know when. Now or after? Great. Ruth, can you give us the reality for where you work with the Red Cross in Southern Africa? Thank you. So as Ruth makes your way to the stage, thank you so much.
where food security is threatened due to a worsening climate. Over 41.2 million people are food insecure, and of this number, 11 million people require urgent assistance, of which the majority are those living in rural areas and are subsistence farmers. These people are primarily dependent on their produce and livestock to support their families and communities. With the negative effects of the drastic climate change in the region, resulting in floods and drought, we are increasingly seeing numerous families unable to meet their daily nutritious needs. As evidenced in rural Zambian communities, being dependent on mangoes and wild fruit, increased livestock deaths in Namibia, Lesotho, Botswana and Zimbabwe, families having little or no access to water, to cook, to drink, to irrigate their crops, and provide water for their livestock, there's also a steady increase in children being diagnosed with malnutrition, which is a byproduct of poor nutrition, which ultimately leads to stunted growth, making them more susceptible to health and mental issues. To combat these issues, the Federation not only intervenes by providing humanitarian services to address these needs of those vulnerable communities, but we also advocate for long-term sustainable and adaptable solutions to food security at the community level. This is conducted through our national societies as well as our valued volunteers. We are working at the household level to ensure those made vulnerable by the floods and drought have access to food and to water. Implementing activities such as the promotion of backyard gardens to improve household access to diversified diets, planting of neem trees, which not only is beneficial for the environment, but also has a medicinal aspect. Rehabilitating water points and innovative livestock product production, just to name a few. In closing, I would like to urge that we develop multi-sectoral programs that will assist communities in identifying, minimizing, and managing the effects of climate change to ensure that they achieve the primary goal of providing for their families. Thank you. So our second theme on the program is early warning, early action to leave no one behind. And the picture that you're seeing is an image of uh, Togolese Red Cross uh, staff and volunteers delivering two canoes to a community that is at risk of what, rising water levels due to uh, the West African monsoon. So of course, taking early action, having those plans in place, and based on early warning, we know can sell, help save lives, livelihoods, and reduce the cost of responding to disasters. We're really keen to see that there's a tension at the level for bridging this divide that we've seen in the past between the humanitarian world and the development and climate world. And so we're um, excited to offer three sessions um, on the program today linked to early warning, early action to leave no one behind. The first session is about the use of remittances and can we explore the potential for using remittances to fund early action based on early warnings. And you'll see that program being led by colleagues from the Climate Center and Mercy Corps, and a few others. We also have one program on what I just mentioned, translating these global commitments for taking strengthening early warning systems and taking early action. We have a lot of commitment now at the global level, including at the recent Oncast Summit. What does it take to make sure that they transit to reality at the national level and truly then trickle down to benefits, with benefits for the most vulnerable communities? And so we'll have a session on that, exploring the challenges and opportunities for doing so. And the third session under this theme is a bit um, not what you would expect when you think of early warning, early action. You may have seen on the program a session about climate grief. We do know we have information about the world that awaits us, and we do try to often say there is hope, there's a lot that we're doing, the global community is coming together, but nonetheless, we are noticing the phenomenon of people feeling anxiety, depression, what we may be able to label climate grief about the future, not about what's already happened, about what awaits us. And so the third session under this theme will be unpacking this concept of climate grief, trying to understand what it's about, what we can do about it, how we can manage it, and it's um, going to be quite out of the box. So please come and join any of those sessions. We look forward to seeing you there.
And for the human face on the early warning, early action theme, I'd like to invite my colleague from the Kenya Red Cross, Esther, to share a bit of her experiences working on this. Thank you, Karina. Good morning. So, um, I'm part of a local branch in Nairobi, and I would like to share our experience. One of the truth that April last year, 119 households were swept away in Silanga village in Kibera. And this was due to flash floods, where a stream nearby burst its banks, and the water went to the homes. To put this into perspective, 601 persons were displaced just in one night. Um, and to add on that, we lost two people in that incident. So what happened this year, we as Red Cross and other partners, we came together and decided we needed to do an warning and action and also work with the communities. So, what we've done is that we've collaborated with the Kenya Meteorological Department and other partners where they offer weekly forecasts. So we use this weekly forecast to inform the communities. However, the weekly forecasts have also been enhanced by ensuring that we give uh, potential impacts of the weather events that will be occurring between the week. So we break this information. Of course, uh, the production is usually in English. So we work with our community-based disaster response teams to break the, uh, or to uh, they, they, they set the information into a local language, and uh, where we translate it into Swahili and Shell, which is mostly used by the young people. And we send this information via social media, using Facebook, using uh, WhatsApp, uh, by videos or just messages or just um, voice messages. The other thing is that we're also working with the local media. Uh, something interesting in Nairobi is that every informal settlement has a local media that, um, like a, a local FM radio that is usually represented by the locals. So we are using those media houses to offer advisories on what uh, the community should do when there is a, in this event and what is expected and what that means for everyone within Nairobi. So we've managed to share information about uh, what the community should do, like moving from the lower, the lower grounds to higher grounds. Of course, uh, we've also shared about uh, the dangers of uh, walking in still water or moving water and also information about emergencies in case someone is distressed, they can call the Red Cross to support them. <coughs> the other thing is that um, we've also collaborated with the local communities to open up drainage systems. One of the huge challenges, especially in the informal settlement, is that we don't have a proper structured way of waste disposal. So this waste disposal usually um, uh, clog the drainage system and when there is uh, rainfall, then the water is, uh, has no place to go. So because currently since the second week of October till today, we've experienced enhanced rainfall due to positive in the ocean dive. That is something I also had to learn with a lot of climate, you know, climate science, but it is very important for the community to understand what is happening. So that is what we've done, and so far, we have not received any call of distress from the communities. So for us, we feel like uh, the uh, information sharing with the communities has really helped in uh, ensuring that they are aware about the environment and the weather events and what to do. Uh, the other thing is that we've also been uh, doing uh, contingency planning and looking at the weather forecast, uh, preparing for the worst case scenarios to respond in case there's any distress. So that is my story. Thank you. Our next theme is Financing a Resilient Future. And we have Santiago. 
Santiago from IDRC to introduce this theme. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Santiago Alba with IDRC. Uh, and what better to talk about resilience and finance than moss and rocks? Uh, and I don't know if you have had the pleasure of seeing under the microscope a dry, almost dead piece of moss and put a drop of water and how the moss actually can survive. Because the communities that we serve actually are the most resilient of the beings that we have. And the finance that they receive can actually make them support these rocky times that they have ahead. I have today the pleasure to be here on um, behalf of IDRC, IIED, and Climate Kick. And I think one thing that we all agree is that we need to get the climate development and finance system right. When only a dollar every 10 reach on delivers local climate action, we are missing vital local information, knowledge, innovation. The current system, the way that we are doing it, is leaving too many behind. We are not, the climate finance today are not tackling key drivers on gender inequalities, the, right, the, the rights of women, vulnerabilities, chronic poverty, resources, degradations, and the impact of climate change. It's the moment that we need to talk, work together even more than ever. The states, governments of all the levels, private sector, civil society, and communities in particular need to engage how climate finance and private investment uh, can build a more resilient future. <coughs> Today we are going to be asking participants of the session for your perspectives in how actually climate finance can promote inclusivity and can help communities to have and to build more resilient future. So, with that, I want to introduce Gia from the UK that is going to be talking, an expert on innovative approach to um, finance data. Is that correct? Um, so, hi everybody. Um, I'm Gaia and I'm from a non profit called Icebreaker One. Um, so, we're working to bridge the data gaps between finance policy, science and assets. And how that actually relates to this theme of financing resilient future is really simple. We've already heard that the current financing systems are not fit for purpose if we want to create a resilient future. The decisions we make today are going to impact our future, but currently we don't have the data available or we aren't using it in order to make climate smart investments in things, for example, such as our infrastructure. But I'm here to talk about practical solutions, and that's what I'd like to see emerge from today's discussions too. The key blocker that we've identified is actually that getting to the crucial data is a lot of effort currently. It's really difficult to search for it, and when you do find it, it can take a really long time to negotiate the licensing rights to it, which means that we're not making sound investment decisions. But this isn't about the technology, it's actually about the culture. It's about the cultural mechanics of data sharing. It's about stepping away from the models that we're in currently, which are about closed by default. And it's about understanding that there are many situations where we can and should be sharing data to generate both public and private good. So that's what we're doing. Um, so, what we need to do in order to address this problem at scale is actually focus on the infrastructure that we already have in place at scale today, which is the web. We're bringing together policy makers, infrastructure builders, finance experts, scientists, insurers and NGOs to agree to share principles and practice for data sharing, to figure out what the licensing looks like, to figure out what the legal, the rights and the liability issues look like too. So we're working on how we can get data flowing across transportation, across agriculture, energy, water and construction in a way that allows people to make carbon zero decisions. We're focused on the question of 
How can we unlock access to data to inform the kinds of systems that we want to create? So I'd actually like to leave you with a reflection today and a question. To finance a resilient future, we need to understand our investments. To understand our investments, we need to enable data access. To do that, we need to agree the shared principles and practice to change the cultural mechanics of data sharing. And we need to take businesses, governments, NGOs and scientists on that journey with us. So my question to you all is, what could we enable if we agreed the shared principles and practice for data interoperability at scale? What could we create? If you'd like to talk to me more about this, I will be here all day, or you can head to icebreaker1.org forward slash join. Thanks very much. Our second to last theme is uh, establishing resilient cities and infrastructure. We've got Zinta for a brief overview of what's to be expected. Thank you very much. Um, as you all know, cities are homes. They're centers of the economy, centers of power. <coughs> they fuel innovation. But cities are also increasingly affected by climate-related hazards. Europe, in Europe this summer, cities uh, suffered from heat waves. We see bushfires burning outside of Sydney right now. Esther has mentioned the impact of flash floods in East Africa. This year, as part uh, in 2020, uh, governments have committed as part of the Sendai framework to create subnational DRR plans. That includes plans, DRR plans for cities. And this information is also critical for the creation of NAPs and will hopefully also feed into NDCs. So it's a big year and lots of action can be taken. In our two city sessions uh, this morning, the first session will explore some of the challenges. You will hear from uh, the private sector, you'll hear from the humanitarian sector, you'll hear uh, a local perspective from Nigeria, and also a challenge in infrastructure. And as the audience, you'll be asked to think of solutions to try to address these challenges. Then, in the second session, uh, you will have the opportunity, we've uh, UNDRR has printed special DNC Day dollars, to be an, become an investor. You'll be pitched uh, innovative, transformative ideas uh, that could fuel solutions for cities and infrastructure. And you will be allowed to choose uh, which of these ideas you would like to invest in to help build a better future. And for a little bit of perspective uh, from the ground, I'd like to invite Jennifer to the stage. She's joining us from Nigeria.
artwork was going to be everywhere, and then we got moved. And the team wasn't able to come to Madrid, plans changed. And so what we do have is still one session that is focused on nature-based solutions, and then we've done the best we can to integrate and BS nature-based solutions through the rest of the sessions. And because the IAD team that was leading on this isn't here with us today, we do have um, the pleasure of having Xiao Ting from IIED to speak to you a little bit about what's in store and with regards to this theme. So Xiao Ting is on recording that would pop up. Just... Warmest greetings to all. I'm Xiao Ting from IAD. It has been a great pleasure working with so many amazing partners to bring nature into the DNC Day discussions. A thriving natural environment is fundamental for human resilience. For example, bees help pollinate crops, trees on farms help improve water and nutrient retention, birds help control pests, and earthworms help improve the fertility of soil. All these are essential ecosystem services provided by nature for resilient agriculture systems. Green roofs and gardens in cities and forested areas around urban watersheds can provide cooling relief for ever-warming cities. They can also provide more reliable food sources and clean water supplies. Forests on mountain slopes can reduce damage caused by avalanches and the risk of landslides. And mangroves can protect communities from storm surges, help reduce the risk of natural disasters. In addition to helping us adapt to climate change, Nature can also help capture carbon and bring development benefits. For the poor and the most vulnerable communities, working with nature is often the most cost-effective and sometimes the only affordable way to adapt to climate change. But biodiversity continues to decline at an alarming rate in every region of the world. We urgently need to channel more funds and create more incentives for nature-based approach and support vulnerable communities who are heavily dependent on natural resources. Working with nature to build resilience is interlinked with all the other themes at DNC days and touch upon every topic you will be discussing today. Your discussion on this theme are also very timely, as more and more governments and companies, including many at this COP, are recognizing the importance of finding integrated solutions to the interlinked crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. We hope everyone at DNC Days can take this excellent opportunity to share experiences of working with nature, including best practices and lessons learned. We hope the discussions today can inspire future collaborations to scale up nature-based solutions for a shared, more resilient future. Lastly, I'm very sorry that I won't be able to attend in person, but we are very excited that many participants today are local champions of nature-based solutions and can bring their wealth of experience into the discussions. We wish you a fruitful day of interactions and inspirations.